Hey everyone, my name is Leland. I'm the executive pastor here at Monterey Church. And every month we're focusing on one spiritual practice to learn and practice together. And this month we're actually going to be talking all about the spiritual practice of hospitality. So I know right up front, you may be hearing the word hospitality and you're immediately thinking of someone like um, Martha Stewart or um, I don't know, other people who are known for that kind of thing. Um, or you may just have other visions of hospitality based on what we see in our culture today. And that is very different than the ancient Christian practice of hospitality that Jesus demonstrated. So today, um, I want to cover exactly what the spiritual practice of hospitality is and why it's a mandate for um, all of us as followers of Jesus. And finally, I just want to give some practical ideas on how, how you can incorporate this practice as a, as a consistent and integral part of your life. So let's start with the what. What is the practice of hospitality? So the Greek word for hospitality um, it's really beautiful. It's um, philoxenia. And this is a, a compound word and it combines um, philos, which, which means it's like platonic love. It's brotherly love. You want to think of like um, uh, Philadelphia, right? The, the city of brotherly love. Philos. And then it's combined with xenon. And xenon just means um, a guest, an outsider, or a foreigner. So really hospitality means the love for strangers or the love of the outsider. Where xenophobia is actually the fear of strangers, hospitality is the opposite. It's to demonstrate the love of strangers through tangible acts. Uh, Rosario Butterfield in her book, uh, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, she talks about how all followers of Jesus um, must practice what she labels as radically ordinary hospitality. I love that. And she defines it as um, when you're using your home in a, in a daily way, in a regular way that seeks to make strangers into neighbors and neighbors as a part of the family of God. There's actually a ton of different ways that you can define the spiritual discipline. Um, and that's because it's just, it's kind of hard to define. Hospitality is more of a lens. It's a framework on how we steward the gifts, like our homes um, that God gives us to reach others. It's a heart posture and, and it leaks out of our life in tangible acts of love for others. Um, one way to help us understand what it is is to look at what it's not, right? So hospitality, the kind we're talking about today, it's not entertainment, it isn't performance art, the goal isn't um, simply entertaining others or impressing others. It doesn't require a fancy home or formal invitations. In fact, it doesn't even require a home at all, right? It just requires um, a heart for others. So for our purposes, um, we're going to use Pastor John Mark Comer's definition. I really love this. And I think it just um, sums up this spiritual practice perfectly. But his definition for hospitality and ours for uh, today is going to be demonstrating the welcoming heart of the Father to all through tangible acts of love, such as providing food, shelter, and relationships. So demonstrating that welcoming heart of the Father to all through tangible acts of love, such as providing food, shelter, and relationships. So that is the definition of what hospitality is. So now let's talk about the why. It's so important. Why is it so important as followers of Jesus to practice hospitality? And the first reason usually is our first reason for all of our practices, is because that's what Jesus did. As um, disciples of Jesus, remember, we're always striving to grow to live and love more like Jesus while leading others to do the same. And quite frankly, practicing hospitality was one of, if not the primary ways that Jesus lived and loved. Uh, Jesus announces to the audience that actually he was speaking to that the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. The Gospels clearly tell us um, not only Jesus' purpose for coming here, right? He came to serve. He came to give his life as a ransom. And he came to seek and save the lost. Um, the Gospel tells us his purpose, but it also shows us his method. It says that he came eating and drinking. His mission strategy was a long meal. His, um, 
He did evangelism. He did discipleship around a table. Professor and author uh, Robert Karras um, points out that in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. And what is really important for us not to miss um, really is who Jesus often dined with, right? who he had a meal with. We see over and over again that Jesus chose to eat and drink with, with strangers, with um, the outcasts of society, with sinners. And honestly, we just can't fathom how important it was to share a meal in Jewish culture during that time, during the first century. Um, Jewish meal times were far more than just like a time to consume food, right? They were, it was something that was sacramental. It was um, even had a, a number of purity and ceremonial laws and requirements. Um, and that's because sharing a meal around the table, the table, which was was seen as even the altar of the Lord. It was intimate. It was sacred. And, and being invited to a meal had actually become a, a ceremony that symbolized, it symbolized friendship and intimacy and even unity. It would be embar- it would be mortifying to actually betray or be unfaithful to someone that had that you'd shared a meal with at your dinner table. And, and when people were estranged for any reason, it was an invitation to a meal that would open the way to reconciliation. Meals were just so important. And with that context, you can imagine the uproar that Jesus caused when Jesus gets invited to, um, say, the Pharisees' homes, and then he doesn't take part in the cleansing rituals. Or uh, when we see that Jesus eats and spends this sacred and this intimate time at a dinner table with the impure, with the unclean, with the public outcasts. Um, He even gets called a glutton who eats and drinks with the enemies of God. It was provocative, it was radical, and it it ultimately led to the call to crucify him. New Testament scholar Joshua Jip, he he says um, that the entire ministry of Jesus can be described as divine hospitality to the stranger and sinner. So if this is how Jesus lived, Why would we think we should live any differently? We do what Jesus did. Number two, um, we're actually commanded to be hospitable. This is a matter of obedience. Romans 12, 13, always be eager to practice hospitality. Hebrews 13, 2, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. Um, We see it's a requirement to be an elder of the church. Scripture is clearly and consistently defining and illustrating Um, hospitality from really Genesis to the end of the New Testament. Practicing hospitality isn't a suggestion. It's really a mandate for all apprentices of Jesus. Number three, hospitality breaks down walls with our neighbors. Hospitality welcomes others. It creates space to listen to others, to learn, to provide for their needs. And encounter by encounter, or maybe meal by meal, hospitality breaks down Um, fear and actually reconstructs um, shared experiences over the meal table, over the dinner table. Um, Meals in general just kind of slow things down, right? It's where we learn from those that are maybe different than us and where we overcome our fears of those differences. It's um, where we can have nuanced conversations regarding complex subjects um, in our world, which actually prefers to communicate in sound bites and Twitter quotes. Hospitality breaks down walls between us and those who are different than we are. But it not only breaks down walls, but number four, hospitality builds bridges, and it builds bridges to Jesus. As mentioned, hospitality was often um, Jesus' method of reaching the lost. It's not that hospitality saves people, right? But people are saved through the gospel message. But it's sharing a meal together. It's providing a place to sleep. It's selflessly just caring for others that just creates that natural opportunity to share the good news with others. It just creates time to talk, to ask questions, to meet others where they're at and not where we think they should be. It provides the opportunity to naturally share um, how we're trying to live according to the ways of Jesus and demonstrating a lifestyle that's normative for us. It's just another avenue for the healing power of the gospel to begin to do its work. Number five, practicing hospitality is good stewardship. 
Okay, honestly, um, as an introvert, I'm not gonna lie, hospitality is extremely challenging for me. It, it is not my natural inclination, or embarrassing to admit this, but even desire to have um, people over all the time, especially those that I don't know well. But this practice challenges me. Um, it challenges me to manage what God has entrusted with me and my time, my money, especially my home, to manage it according to his wishes. And that is stewardship. He is the master. And, and when I look at my home as a haven that I retreat to, um, or you probably heard the saying, it's our castle, right? But castles are designed to protect and keep others out. Um, when I'm thinking of my home in those ways, I'm not practicing good stewardship. Hospitality changes the way that I actually enforces me to look at my time, my, my monthly food budget, um, even forces me to carve out margin for others. And maybe most importantly, to see our home as a gift to be used to further his kingdom. It is good stewardship. Okay, number six, our last reason, hospitality is a blessing. When we serve, when we minister, and even just strive to bless others, we can't help but be blessed ourselves. And just one aspect of that blessing is um, by opening up your home, by opening up yourself to others, you're actually inviting God's presence. Hebrews 13, 2 says, um, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have actually shown hospitality to angels without even knowing it. I think this verse isn't a threat, but actually is a promise. Um, maybe by refusing hospitality, we're actually shutting out the help and guidance of God himself. We know that Matthew 25 tells us that um, God often disguises himself among the broken, among the poor. We know that what we do for the least of those, we do for Christ himself. Hospitality is a blessing and invites his presence. Okay. That is the what, and that is the why. So to close, I just wanna share some practical tips on how. But before I jump into the, just some practical ideas for getting started, I wanna clarify and emphasize a couple things. And that's first, one of the most important things to rem remember about this practice is that um, hospitality not only calls us to open our homes, but our hearts. Peter talks about this in his, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, he says, um, offer hospitality to no one, but do it without grumbling. I actually get what Peter was talking about there because um, hospitality isn't always easy. It often takes patience. It forces us to get out of our comfort zones, um, requires selflessness, um, and sometimes a thick skin. So that is why hospitality requires prayer. Prayer is an essential part of this practice. Uh, we must pray to even ask God who he's calling us to be hospitable to, um, what it looks like for us. I know um, my wife and I, we even just try to pray before guests come just to invite Holy Spirit to work um, first and foremost in our own hearts. We need to be praying uh, before, we need to be praying during, we need to be praying after our gatherings. Prayer is this common thread that must be woven throughout the entire practice of hospitality. Okay, the second thing to remember is, um, in addition to having the right heart, or maybe along those lines, uh, it's just remembering our guests matter more than our hospitality. Our, our aim is to serve, not impress. Our space uh, doesn't need to be perfectly clean. So let's face it, it's kind of scary for guests anyways. Uh, hospitality doesn't require the perfect environment taken from Pinterest or whatever, or a five course meal of fancy food. Hospitality is just sharing what we have, and that's it. And remember, hospitality, it is an entertainment. We're not trying to impress every, anyone. It's, um, in fact, even in humility, we aren't embarrassed to ask our guests for help, right? Christian hospitality, this is where everyone is treated as family, including asking everyone to pitch in. And, and if you live, maybe you live in a condo or an apartment or just rent a room, um, you can still practice hospitality. It just might look different. But um, in the event that you're precluded from using your space in, in this manner, um, you can still get creative, right? You can always maybe help someone else host who does have this space or um, invite others 
to a park or a public space or take others out to a restaurant. Um, you can make food and bring it to someone else's home. Hospitality can be practiced in limitless ways and in all kinds of spaces. Okay, so now I just wanna quickly run through hospitality ideas, right? This is just get you started, get you thinking. Um, okay, one idea. Consider sitting down and making what we call it a neighbor map. This is where you draw your house, your apartment, um, your room, and then you, and you draw where four to five of your closest neighbors' houses or apartments are right around you. Um, and then see if you can write in the names of your neighbors or how about your chil the, their children's names or pets' names, right? Um, maybe even include detail. What, it, what do they do? What do they enjoy? And if you can't fill out that map completely, just, just work to be able to fill that map, map out. That gives you a direction. Uh, maybe by filling out the map, you realize I don't even know my neighbor's names, right? So maybe just set a due date to introduce yourself to those neighbors that you don't know um, and put that on your calendar and hold yourself accountable for it. Okay, here's another idea. Make your house the gathering place um, for your kids or your teenagers' friends, right? This means letting your kids know that their friends are welcome and you want them to be part of the home. It likely means um, you're gonna have to have lots of food and drinks, and I mean lots. Uh, and maybe it's investing in like lawn games or darts or ping pong or just fun activities that invite others to hang out and stay. And just remember to send the message that um, they're welcome. Come stay, come be part of our family, our home. Another idea is just being careful to utilize all of our holidays, right? Or birthdays or any celebration as an opportunity to invite others that you don't know or know as well. Uh, maybe one step is to sit down and look at your monthly budget and then make room for hospitality and then ensure that you're using that portion of your budget for those purposes. And this may mean that you have to sacrifice in other areas in order to serve others. Uh, in, in order to really incorporate this practice into your, your personal rule of life, um, we may also want to just create a new tradition. Um, there's all kinds of ways. Maybe it's like every Sunday afternoon um, you have a, a late lunch or um, Sabbath Saturday dinner or Monday night football or Taco Tuesday, whatever it is. It's, it's being intentional to create a permanent rhythm in your home and a time that provides this open invitation for others to come and live life together. Maybe it's throwing a block party or a 4th of July party, a meet your neighbor potluck. Um, maybe it's using a spare room or, or being creative with the space in your home um, that's just devoted primarily to housing others, to um, letting others know that there's always a place for those who need it in your home. I can't think of a better way to demonstrate the love of strangers than answering the call to foster children or adopt. And, and maybe that seems totally out of reach for you, um, then get involved with organizations like Safe Families, which provides all kinds of opportunities to um, support families before the children are actually forced into the foster system. And by the way, um, you can find info on Safe Families, they are awesome, under our Serve tab. Um, they are an incredible organization and a great way to serve. Okay, so these are just examples just to get you thinking and dreaming how you can start turning this practice into a way of life. So, did any of these seem easy? Maybe just doable? Then let's start there. I would start right there. Um, or just start somewhere. That's why we call these practices. It's just... Um, something that we just practice, although never master, and then we see Holy Spirit begins to transform us, begins to incrementally um, change us to look more like our master, Jesus. Okay, so that was the quick rundown of the spiritual practice of hospitality. And as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at leland at monterey.church. Um, also, I've included notes of today's teaching along with a list of a few awesome resources um, 
that I use to actually help me prepare this message. And I think there are great ways to dig deeper into this spiritual discipline. Thank you so much for joining me.